Let's all stand together for a reading of the Word of God. This comes from Psalms 47. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. Let's sing together this morning. morning. For those of you in the room and those of you who are joining us online, we welcome you in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much for choosing to be here with us today. 
Our mission at the Springs is to be transformed in the image of God so that anyone can find their way to him. We regularly celebrate this continuing transformation by celebrating special milestones in the lives of our friends and family. Last week we celebrated kiddos going right into kindergarten and um, this week we celebrate middle school students. In a moment we will share a video um, celebrating our sixth and seventh grade students. And when the video is over, um, Phil Lothman will come and offer a prayer on their behalf. In the past, we have celebrated um, this passages for students entering the seventh grade. However, since our sixth graders um, are joining our middle school Bible class, we are so anxious to be together for that again. <laughs> and we hope that soon we will be able to gather for Bible classes safely. It seemed appropriate to include them this year. So today we celebrate the passage of our sixth and seventh grade students into middle school and into our youth and family ministry. This is an important time in the development of our adolescent students and it can it can be and often is challenging bodies and brains undergo enormous amounts of change in a very short period of time often one of them ahead of the other which any parent who has raised a middle school child can attest to and grandparents and those of you who watch us do it this is why we take time each year um, to celebrate this time as a reminder that we do not do life alone. And as a church family, we are in it together. It's also a good time to remember the ministry values that have guided the Springs for a long time. Family first. We believe that parents are absolutely the most important influence in the lives of our children and bear the responsibility of guiding them in the way of Jesus. This is why you will see and hear the parents of our students blessing them in the video we are about to share. Community confirms. We believe that parents and students need the support of our whole community and our encouragement as they work on learning and practicing the way of Jesus. This is why we choose to share the celebration with our whole community in worship. Scripture rules. We believe that scripture is God's word to us, that it is true and always points to Jesus, who taught that loving God with, with all that you are and loving others in the same way are the greatest things we will ever do. And everyone ministers. Every person in this room and every person watching online has a gift to offer from the youngest to the oldest, from the most talented to the least, from those who are wealthy and poor. We have so much to learn from one another. And now I hope you will be encouraged by the lives of our families with middle school students and offer your encouragement to them in return. Isaiah, we want you to know how super excited we are for you that you get to take this next step in your development as you're becoming an outstanding young man. Every day with you has been an incredible journey and we are so blessed that God picked our family just for you. You mean a lot to us and you keep us in smiles all the time and we have a very special blessing for you today. From Isaiah, your namesake, chapter 12 verse 2 surely god is my salvation i will trust and will not be afraid for the lord god is my strength and my might he has become my salvation 
We love you. Have a great time in youth group. Addie, we are so proud of the young lady you are becoming. As you enter the youth group, we pray that God's word continues to grow in your heart and that it leads you closer and closer to Jesus. Addie, we ask God to send you good friends and to help you be a good friend. We ask God to give you wisdom and grace, and we ask God to give you lots of laughter and joy. We love you, we Addie. Love you, Addie. Casey, we love you. We love all the qualities, the wonderful qualities that God has blessed you with. And we pray that everyone gets the opportunity to know you and your kindness and caring. I know, Casey, that you're going to be a wonderful influence on your friends. But our biggest prayer is that God would bless you with many, many, many moments that become those wonderful memories of your youth. We love you. Hi, Kason. We are very excited about you being in youth group now, and I'm excited to see you grow um, with your friends and in your faith. Case, you're already everything we could want in a son and then some. So as you continue to take this journey in life, we just hope you'll continue to make God a part of it. We love you. Hey Shad, we are so excited for you to start this new adventure of middle school. And while none of this looks like we thought it would ever look, we're so excited for the things that lie ahead for you. And we're gonna be claiming 2 Timothy 1.7 over you, where God says, you are not born with a spirit of fear, but with a spirit of power and love and of sound mind. And we are just praying that this year you will be bold in your convictions, bold for Christ, and a shining example to everyone around you. You've always been a great teammate. You love it when you take care of business and when you succeed, but you're just as excited when your friends and teammates do that too. Be a great teammate in the youth group. God bless you, buddy. Bodie, we can't believe that you have made it all the way to middle school and you're going to be a part of the youth group now. Like, really, we're pretty surprised that you made it this far. Yeah, I was kind of touch and go there for a while. Still kind of is. But in all seriousness, Bodie, we, um, you continue to surprise us every day. Um, you have always done it the Bodie way, and uh, we wouldn't have it any different. But uh, with that, we thought the best blessing for you is to ask that God, um, that, that God help you to be a leader at first, we were going to um, we're going to give you this blessing, and that is, it says, do everything without complaining or arguing. <laughs> we thought surely at some point that will pass. So we decided on Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, and it says, be an imitator of God, therefore, as dearly beloved child of his, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. And then also we want you to remember the verse out of our Osborne family motto, which is, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. We love you, buddy. Love you, bud. Shall we pray? Holy Father and Jehovah God, we come before your humble throne or your magnificent throne humbly, acknowledging your, the grace and mercy that, that you shower down upon us. This morning we lift up the young people that we just saw. We know that individually you are aware of their needs and we just ask that you would bless Walker, Isaiah, Addie, Casey, Kaysen, Shad, and Bodie, Father, that you would help them to continue to grow in, in the righteous ways that uh, 
that you have put before us and that you would put before them. Bless their parents that they always will direct their lives and direct their teachings to help them grow and mature in your word. And as a family, as the congregation, that you would always give us soft hearts to help us interact in a positive manner with these, with these young minds and hearts. We thank you so much for the blessings of these children, and we just pray that you would continue to work righteousness in all of our lives. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, that through his blood we have redemption. And in his holy name we pray. Amen. Let's all be standing.
This is a word written by Paul um, to the Roman Christians. And he said, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment, are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not reveling in drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Will you pray with me, please? Jesus, you are the embodiment of love. Thank you for living and loving in and through us. You unite us as we gather around your table Jesus, would you forgive us for any harm 
we have done to a neighbor or to one another. Amen. Would you come to the tables? of God, 
born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. I have a living hope. I have a future. God has a plan for me. Of this I'm sure, of this I'm sure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Your word is faithful. Of this I'm sure, Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. 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 Have a seat. Well, good morning, Springs Church. Blessings upon you, and I want to welcome everybody here once again online in the room. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ today. It's so good to be with you. And I want to also invite you to another worship gathering <clears throat> outdoors uh, that's happening tonight in the northeastern, <clears throat> oh man, it's happening again. <laughs> oh, it's the allergies, I think, I hope. 
There's a, a worship time outdoors in the northeastern corner of the parking lot happening again tonight. We're going to bump the start time from 7 p.m. to 6.30 p.m., though. We're hoping to catch a little more of that waning sunlight, and we're hoping to catch maybe a few more young families. 6.30 is a little bit more conducive to bedtimes. So 6.30 tonight, northeastern corner of the parking lot. We'd love to have you there, a time of scripture, song, devotional, prayer. It's going to be really, really wonderful. So I want to extend that invite to you all again. And I also want to extend once more uh, for the second week in a row an invitation to next Sunday when we begin Revelation Citizens of a Different Kingdom. This is a brand new sermon series. We're going to be spending time in Revelation for probably about 10 to a dozen weeks or so. And Ben's going to kick us off next week. There's a lot we could say about it, but I'm just going to leave you uh, excited to come, whether online or in person, invite folks. This is really, really going to be an excellent study. So I hope you will be here next Sunday, September 13, in whatever form, to join us for the beginning of this study, Revelation, Citizens of a Different Kingdom. All that said, we are closing down the word of the Lord this morning, although I hope that we'll get to return to this sermon series once again, perhaps in years future. Um, I hope you've been blessed and encouraged and challenged by the word of God, and we're going to finish out this morning in Ezekiel chapter 33. So you, mortal, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked ones, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity. But their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Now you, mortal, say to the house of Israel, thus you have said, our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Jesus, we give thanks to you once again this morning for your word. Lord, bless us with the presence of your Holy Spirit this morning. Bless us as we cry out for wisdom, as we cry out for understanding, as we cry out for instruction in the ways of walking with you. We ask for illumination this morning. I ask for the gift of preaching. And we ask that you would put into our hearts once again the power of your gospel truth. We praise you, do Jesus, and it's in your name we pray, amen. To put it mildly, it's been a strange year. And appropriately, we've been spending time in some strange parts of the Bible, right? We spent some time in Ecclesiastes, if you weren't with us this past spring, We'll be starting Revelation next week. And this morning, we are in, bar none, the strangest of the prophets, Ezekiel. Ezekiel, let me put it this way, if the prophets were pop stars, we could say Isaiah's probably like Taylor Swift. I'm not particularly a huge Taylor Swift fan, but Isaiah is, he's popular, he's a good writer, he, you know, he's, he's great with words, and I, that's Isaiah. And if Isaiah is Taylor Swift, Ezekiel is Lady Gaga. <laughs> right? Maybe for you older folks, I don't know, Madonna, somebody out there, right? So 
Ezekiel's not just going to come sing a song for you. He's going to do it in a meat dress. Right? That's Ezekiel. Right? It, there is this sort of strange performative oddness that is the hallmark of Ezekiel's prophetic ministry. He, he does these strange sort of sign acts to try and, and he does it for a purpose. He does it to grab people's attention. He wants to do something arresting to communicate this urgent word of the Lord to them. That's Ezekiel's purpose as a prophet. And we see that all throughout the book and we see it holding true for our passage this morning beginning in verse seven of chapter 33 where God says to Ezekiel, so you, mortal, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. So just a little bit of background, Ezekiel was a priest in Jerusalem in the 6th century BC. And Babylon at that time attacked Jerusalem for the first time, but they didn't destroy the city at that moment, but they took some prisoners. And Ezekiel was one of those prisoners. He was taken back to Babylon as a, a refugee. And so he's in Babylon and God appears to him and calls him to prophesy, to bring a word of warning to Israel and to the nations. And the way that God frames his ministry for him is that Ezekiel's going to be a sentinel. He's going to be a watchman, right? He's going to be someone standing on a tower, watching the horizon, and blowing the ram's horn of the threat that is imminent. That is the way that God frames Ezekiel's ministry, as a sentinel. And in fact, I brought a couple pictures this morning that I took about a decade ago, and these were taken on the Great Wall of China. Um, I took these about a decade ago, and it's really incredible to be there because China was building these stretches of walls even before Ezekiel's time, like in the 7th century BC. But the Great Wall Project really ramped up again around the 14th century AD during the Ming Dynasty, a little bit after the time of Genghis Khan for obvious reasons, right? This was a very deadly, devastating time and place in human history. And so there were these Mongolian raids happening from the north and they revamped this Great Wall project for protection. And the way in those days that you protected yourself was to put a guy in a tower and say, watch. All right, long before anyone could have possibly imagined a satellite, you put a guy in a tower and you say, watch. And so they did, they installed some 25,000 watchtowers. You can see a few of them in this, these two photos. And I, it's interesting to look at this photograph on the right and, and you look and you imagine standing on that wall. You imagine looking off into the horizon and, and seeing this sort of mass slowly coalesce in the distance. And you see it start to, to come towards you and you realize that your enemies are on the march. You realize there is danger on the horizon. And you pick up that ram's horn, which is not a musical instrument. It is clearly for alarm. And you blow it and you hear that awful sound and you feel the pit of your stomach drop. That's the way God frames Ezekiel's ministry. Right? He says, you're a watchman, and, and you gotta keep an eye out for, for this wickedness, for the sin and judgment that is coming upon the people of Israel and the nations. This is the way that God frames his ministry. It's serious. And, and so it's not surprising that the seriousness continues in verses eight and nine. It says, if I say to the wicked, O wicked ones, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Ezekiel is the guy in the tower who's watching. 
and he blows the horn on the troubles of sin and, and the havoc that is wreaked because of it. And he, he's a priest, remember, and so he sounds quite lawyerly in this section. He sounds, there's a lot of legalities talking about, you know, if, if I warn, but you don't turn, or I do warn, and you don't turn, the culpability, who, what do I owe to you, essentially, is the question. Ezekiel brings up this question, what do we owe one another? And as the people of God, as followers of Christ, what sort of prophetic word of warning do we owe to one another and to the world? These are the questions that Ezekiel raises for us as a watchman. But another question that comes up is, about sin itself. What is it about sin that is so dangerous? What is it about wickedness that produces such a dire situation? I think, I think we can extrapolate a hint from the next verse in verse 10. It says, now you mortal, say to the house of Israel, thus you have said, our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? So this is Israel confessing, and apparently they're, they're finally confessing the gravity of their sin. And I'm so interested in this, this verb of wasting away, right? This idea that, that sin, there is this this rot, this festering, this decay towards death. How then can we live inherent in wickedness? And when we talk about sin, we can talk about it a whole bunch of different ways. We could talk about sin as transgression of the law. We can talk about sin as crossing a communal boundary. We can talk about it as hamartia, that Greek word in the New Testament, missing the mark, right? But I find it helpful in light of this passage to think theologically about sin as a turn toward nothingness. Sin is turning away from the life and being and goodness of God to the death and non-being and evil of nothing. How can we say that? What do we mean? Well, when God creates us, he creates out of nothing, right? God calls us joyously into this existence out of nothing at all. And when we sin, we are turning away from the life of God that he's called us into. We're turning away from his existence back toward the abyss of nothing, back toward the abyss of non-being of lack and absence. That's what sin does. You know, we talk about particularly heinous sins and crimes as dehumanizing. There's this, there's this sense in which when we sin, we are becoming less human, less alive, because we're turning from the goodness of life with God to the evil of nothingness. But the good news is, God wants to save us from that. Right? God doesn't want us to turn back to the nothingness from which he called us. And this text, it sounds serious, but it really is good news. Right? Look at the next verse, verse 11. God says, say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? God does not delight in the death of the wicked. Unlike other ancient gods, God does not want the death of the wicked. He takes no pleasure in it, and neither should we. And God has charged us to bring this prophetic word to each other, to the world, about the fact that God always leaves repentance on the table. All right, that God wants to call us away from that nothingness back to perfect being and goodness and life with him. 
So, how do we give that word? How do we act like Ezekiel as a sentinel, as a watchman? Because in one sense, this is kind of our least favorite part about being a Christian, isn't it? Right? We, the last thing most of us want to be is the guy downtown with the bullhorn yelling about sin and damnation while people are just trying to walk to Bricktown. Right? So how do we deliver this, this serious but good prophetic word to each other, to the church at large, and to the world? Well, how does Ezekiel do it? Remember, Ezekiel is the Lady Gaga of the prophets, right? He performs these strange, odd sign acts throughout the book in order to grab people's attention. So, for instance, we see God calling Ezekiel to do odd things like, like build a model of the city of Jerusalem and then bring an attack upon it. And then God tells Ezekiel to, to cut off all of his hair with a sword and chop it up and burn parts of it. God tells Ezekiel to, no kidding, lay on one side for more than a year. Lay on one side. He's supposed to be evoking the scapegoat. And maybe you've heard of Ezekiel bread it's been in our pantry a time or two. It's pretty good, but in Ezekiel 4, it's actually supposed to be cooked over excrement. Ezekiel is called to do these bizarre, strange actions to grab people's attention with the urgency of the effects of sin and death. So how do we take up that calling? Right? As, as people of God, how do we take up that calling to, to speak to the world about the good news of God and yet the danger that is inherent in this turn towards nothingness? Well, in high school, I read a, one of those best-selling books maybe a number of you have read, a great little Christian memoir called Blue Like Jazz by Donald Miller. It's a good book, and I love one of the stories he tells later in that book. He's talking about he and his Christian friends, and they're on this college campus. It's Reed College in Portland, Oregon. It's a small but prestigious liberal arts school. And it's also known for being quite the party school. Uh, Princeton Review even called it, you know, one of the most secular, kind of godless schools in the nation back when he was there. And he and his Christian friends who've been auditing and taking classes there, they're trying to figure out how do we make our presence known on this campus? How do we tell people, hey, there are Christians here and we care about you and we have some words to say. And so they're just kind of throwing out ideas and Miller just kind of joking around. is like, you know, what we should do is uh, we should build a confession booth in the middle of campus that says confess your sins during Ren Fair. Ren Faire is this three-day campus romp that goes on and everyone's kind of getting drunk and high and naked. And he says, we should build a confession booth that says, confess your sins. And his friends are instantly like, that. no, we have to do that. And he's like, no, no, I was, I was just kidding. That's no. And they're like, no, seriously. Here, but here's the thing. When the Reed students get into the confession booth, we're not gonna ask them to confess their sins to us. We're gonna confess our sins to them. And so they do it. They build this huge confession booth in the middle of Reed College campus during their three-day campus romp, and they paint confess your sins on it, and Miller volunteers to be the first person to sit in the booth, and this student from Reed named Jake shows up, and he says, all right, what's, what's this about? I'm supposed to like tell you all the juicy stuff I've been doing over the last few days? And Miller's like, no, that's, that's not it, actually. He's like, what? I'm supposed to confess my sins to you. He says, no, we, there's a group of us Christians, we actually wanted to confess our sins to you. And he's like, you're serious? He's like, yeah, we, look, we follow Jesus 
but we, we got to be honest, like we haven't done a great job of representing him all the time. And honestly, Christians throughout history, some of them have done a really, really poor job of, of representing him. You think of all the, the terrible things that have been done in the name of the Lord throughout the centuries. And so he said, we just want to, we want to confess that to you and apologize and just say, look, that's not what the message of Jesus is about. And Jake, and he continued to talk, and Jake is kind of welling up even as they talk, and he says, yeah, you mentioned the message of Jesus. What even is that? He's like, well, humankind sinned against God, and God gave the world over to humankind, and yet if you want to be rescued from that rebellion, Christ has done that in the cross. And so Jake finally leaves and another student comes in and this goes on for a couple of hours. They get to confess to like three dozen college students at Reed during Ren Fair. And what's amazing to me about that story is this kind of outlandish, bold, yet incredibly humble way of communicating both the seriousness of rebellion against God and yet the overwhelming power of the love of Christ. In this strange, bizarre, kind of prophetic sign act, they were able <clears throat> to communicate the outlandish oddness of Christ's love We've been given this prophetic task. And Ezekiel inspires us to do that in ways that grab people's attention, in ways that think outside the box, in ways that communicate the urgency of the havoc that sin has wreaked, and we all know the havoc that it wreaks. And yet, at the same time, to, to bury that word of, of danger and warning within the overwhelmingly powerful love of Jesus Christ. And to deliver that in a way that communicates the good news that God doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. But repentance is always on offer. That is what Ezekiel calls us to proclaim. In radical, strange, unsettling, powerfully humble ways to communicate that God is calling us back from nothingness to life. That is the call placed upon us in Jesus Christ. Let's stand and praise God for that salvation this morning. abounding my soul will rest in you I will not fear the war I will not fear the storm my help is on the way my help is on the way Once again, 
tonight, 6.30 in the northeastern corner of the parking lot. It'll be a brief time of worship. I hope we'll get to see a few unfamiliar faces that we haven't seen in a while. I hope you'll invite whomever you can. It'll be a really, really good time. And next week is Revelation. Tune in, come, invite some friends. We'd love to see you here. Let's go ahead and have our conversations again outside if we'll exit beginning with this section once I give this benediction this morning. Our blessing and sending charge. May we boldly announce the amazing arresting forgiveness of God in Jesus Christ. Let's go in peace, church.